so there's uh, this one thing that will probably keep popping up during the whole time. I'm, I'm very thankful that so many of you all came tonight. Uh, we have a whopping 105 people here tonight, which is a record. And uh, tonight we have Hardin International Quality Geophysics. Will Sass is somewhere here. Stand up. Would you stand up? Uh, Vice President from Hardin International, who helped sponsor this so that the price could be kept uh, at a reasonable level. So thank you very much. And I'll just tell you. I'm not going to tell you the purple eggplant story, but we are having purple eggplant. But uh, I'm always happy when I get to look at data processed by Hardin International. <laughs> Max wanted to make sure that everybody understood that the wine and the cheese is going to be a little seminar uh, that he's going to give, a mini seminar on cheese and wine of northern <coughs> Italy. And we'll talk about the geology of that. What's Italy famous for, the northern part of Italy? I'm sure everybody wants a Ferrari like that. But the wines and cheeses that we're going to be having tonight are displayed here, and they're all coming from that northern area. And before I go any further, I should tell you that in your uh, menu, if you look, there's a pullout. We would like to know if you have an area that you'd be interested in hearing about geology and wine. The only place I haven't been where there's geology and wine is um, South Africa. So if you pick that, we'll get an expert of the wine. But uh, otherwise, if you want to go to Australia next year, we can do that. You want to go to Southern Italy, you want to go to Portugal, whatever. But uh, think about it and please fill this out so that we can uh, keep our tax-free status. And I expected twice. Barbaridas, Barbaridas, Alba. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, you know, it does say ask me there. There's the bottom. Let's see what that says. So, can I chew? I <laughs> know. <laughs> kind of sounds funky, but really, this guy has written all of the books that you, people use for reference for cheese, which a few of, well, they're right here. And um, this one, he might have a few of those with him, and I know he brought some swatch books, but they're really fun to read about the cheese, and I think you're going to find Max uh, very entertaining. Max was born in Kentucky, uh, traveled around, uh, lived in uh, South America in Brazil where he was told he couldn't drink the milk and uh, he'll, he'll probably tell a few stories about that but we met Max Mary Virginia and I did with Rachel about 10 years ago in New York City and he was here two years ago who was here two years ago when we did Spain and uh, I think you'll remember he was uh, pretty entertaining but Max knows so much about cheese and We've had a lot of fun. While he's been here, we've now entered another 150 wines and about 30 cheeses into his cheese pairing thing. It's, it's a tough and dirty job, but we're very happy to do it. And tonight, he's going to talk about some special uh, cheeses from northern Italy. But I, I've got to tell you a story. Max, come on up. So one day, I was in New York, and I was delivering a talk to some... Uh, investors that wanted to know uh, about horizontal drilling and how seismic would work with that and they were from Bear Stearns and something you know so I go up there and I'm doing that I don't have anything to do in the evening and Max invites me over to where he's working and there's a seminar on Italian cheese and we're sitting around a horseshoe sized table and they go around introducing themselves and Max is sitting on my right I'm the last person right here boom there's the there's the screen and then they come around, and Max says, I'm Max McCallman. And the teacher goes, oh, my God, I've got, I've got to give this in front of you. And she, she starts getting emotional. And he says, no, it's okay. I want to learn about what you're going to do because I, I, mean, I know a little about Italian cheese. And he says, but, you know, 
really, what you got to watch out for is this guy. And he points at me, and she says, who are you? And I said, nobody. <laughs> and she was afraid. She was set up. But Max and I were um, having a good time. And, uh, you know, when you get to know somebody like Max, and uh, that he'll come here to Shreveport out of his busy schedule. Tomorrow he leaves at 7 a.m. to go to Philadelphia for a two-day seminar that he's leading. But to get him to come here, I feel I'm very, very thankful. And I'd like you to welcome Max back to Shreveport. great to be in Shreveport. As some of you heard earlier, it's a lot, uh, the weather here is a lot better than New York City right now. Um, but um, yeah, this, uh, regarding Northern Italy, this is a part of the world that uh, I have appreciated for a very long time. Uh, firstly, uh, for its wines, some of my first favorite wines were the Northern Italian wines. Before I knew very much about them, I just knew that I liked them for some reason. Uh, but then uh, later, when I became a cheese guy, I started to recognize that there's something about the cheese of northern Italy which makes them distinct. In this small part of the world, there is a greater diversity of cheese types being produced than there is in any other area that small anywhere else in the world today. And that begs the question, so what is it that makes northern Italy a prime uh, region for making these? And there are a number of reasons beyond uh, the, uh, the rocks, the minerals, the soils. It has a lot to do with where it is uh, latitudinally. Uh, it is partly because uh, there is a rare area that sustains not only sheep and goat, which is most of every other part of Italy, but also cows and water buffalo. Water buffalo do pretty well in parts of Italy. So you have the climatic conditions, but also the vegetation that sustains these dairy animals, as well as sustains great agricultural agricultural endeavors and exploits. They call them exploits, including winemaking. So there's all this variety of cheese types and wine types. There's a place in Italy, uh, in New York, that I recommend you visit. Uh, some people do say, so uh, what is a great place to go to? And I say, well, artisanal, yeah, but that was what I helped launch, the artisanal bistro. Some of you have been there. That's where Kevin and uh, Mary Virginia and I had, had um, you know, one of our first encounters in New York. I'm not affiliated with it anymore, but it's still a nice place. But another place you might want to check out is a place called Italy. And it's, on, uh, it's in the, in the uh, Flatiron District on uh, 23rd Street, right off of 5th Avenue. Go in there and just sit down and meet my friend Greg Blaze, my former employee at Artisanal. He's now the main cheese guy there. And so what he does, he uh, introduces uh, some of the best cheese of uh, Northern Italy primarily, because he recognizes that's where the diversity is, but also some of the best cheese produced in the United States and also from other parts of the world. Right now, I recommend that you try some of that white wine, the Arnais. Uh, this is a wine uh, that is um, kind of rare. It's really the only white varietal that is known from this part of Italy. Uh, but it is, uh, use your nose. I recommend that you take very small sips. And, uh, and go back to it a second time. The first sip, the first sip when you're tasting wine is to prepare your palate for the actual taste. So taste the Arnais. Pay attention to what you smell, but also notice the texture of this wine. So what do you smell in this wine? It's unique. It's not like Chardonnay. It's not like Riesling. It's not like Sauvignon Blanc. It's not like Viognier. Uh, does it remind you of any other white grape, or red grape for that matter, that you've ever had before? Isn't it lovely? This is one of the prettiest white wines I've ever encountered. And uh, it, is, it is also a great value, but this is a, a wine type that's, that was barely hanging on. It was virtually extinct a few years ago. It was used as a blending grape in making Barolos. They used to, to make the Barolos, they thought, well, that Viola is a little bit tough. And we want to also increase our, uh, our, 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 uh, our volume. So they added a little bit of this white grape juice into the mix. Later on, and this is about 30 years ago, they start to think, well, actually, the Arnais grape is taken away from what the Nebbiolo grape could do. Nebbiolo, the one that's used to make the Barolos and the Barbadescos. 
So they started to rip up all these arnais grapes, all these vines were being ripped up, and then uh, they started to just focus on the, the, the main, in these regions, and in these regions, I'm talking about vineyards, in these little areas, these little plots were focused on the ideal. By the way, a great place to visit in September is uh, the region in Piemonte, especially around Cugno, where in the little village of Barola, just drive up and down those little tight switchbacks and just smell those grapes when they're at peak, uh, the Nebbiolo grapes, which we're going to have a little bit later from a different region. But instead, with this Arnais, I recommend that you also pay attention to, uh, to, pay attention to the aroma and, the, and the, how acid is this wine. Can you tell approximately what would your guess be? How does it compare to some of the other white wines you've had? Not particularly acid. Now the, the cheeses, before we try any cheeses, we want to give the wines some food. So after you've tried the Arnais, try a little bit of the Vapolicella. And this is a blend of grapes. This is one thing the Italians do pretty well. Uh, is blend grapes. Uh, there's no other region in the world that does uh, quite the job of blending grapes, except for perhaps Bordeaux. And so you have a little bit of the Valpolicella. And so how would you characterize Valpolicella, Rapasso? It has fairly high alcohol content, which is a, which is a quality some of us favor. But for others of us that enjoy drinking, perhaps a little lower alcohol content is favored because I enjoy drinking but I don't like to be drunk. So these two wines from the Northwest and the Northeast, that Kevin pointed out uh, their sources. Now we're gonna see how these cheeses pair with these wines. And the four cheeses, the first four, but the two, the first two cheeses are from the Piemonte in the Northwest. And this, these are types of cheeses that have been around for millennia. Blended milk cheeses. Start with the cheese closest to you. That is a Romeo Loretta. Without any wine in your mouth, now try it. You might want to have a little bit of water, but have a little bit of that first cheese, Romeo Loretta, that makes a goat, sheep, and cow. The one at 6 o'clock on your plate is a bloomy rind cheese. This is essentially, this is kind of a new type of cheese, but it's based on old recipes where they would mix a little bit of the goat, sheep, and cow milk because sheep only give milk for about six months of the year. The goat can give 10 months of the year, but a lot of lot of lion. They add a little cow's milk in the mix. So this is the best of three worlds. What I find with cheese types such as this, is the Robio Roqueta, is that you have, what would you expect when you have three milk types as far as the pairing potential? What you might expect is that you have a greater synergy greater uh, potential for pairings with mixed milk cheese than you do with one milk cheeses. So with a, this type of cheese, it will probably work pretty well with the Arnais. It will probably work pretty well with the Vapolicella. Have a little taste of cheese. Now try it with the Arnais. Make a little sauce in the mouth. Ask yourself, would you have this again? Probably. So what makes these pairings work? Number one is anticipation. Okay, we've been waiting for some food now for quite a while. Uh, there is that. There is a little bit of that hunger and thirst. But also that cheese is just a little bit salty, just a little bit, and the wine has its fruit. So they have that balance of fruit and sweet, or uh, fruit and uh, savory, or salty and sweet, that balancing act between cheese and wine. That's one reason why they make great partners. Uh, cheese number two. Don't go there yet. Instead, try the Rubio Rocchetto with the Valpolicella. Because we wanted to assess the cheeses. The cheeses are more powerful than the wines. Invariably. Try the same cheese with the Valpolicella and see how that mixes. Which one do you like better? This is an opportunity to start to build your database if you haven't already. That little swatch book out there is based on 20 years of pairing cheese and wines and taking notes. My liver has done the work for you. Only $15 for you. So you take that little swatch book and you will find some recommended pairings based on my experience of eating cheese and drinking wine. So. 
On this score sheet, you might taste that Romeo Rochetto with your anise, taste it with the Vapolicella, and if you like it, you might want to remember it so you can replicate that experience again. If you like it, you might want to say, that's a positive experience, I'll give that a one. That's a good score. If it's just okay, it's a zero. If you love it and you say, wow, I'll do that again, give it a plus two. But if you don't like it so much, it's a negative one. If you hate it, you don't want to do it again, that's a negative two. So write your scores with the white wine and the red wine. You have pencils also. You should have pencils on the tables. Make sure you drink water. And after you try these two cheeses, rate your pairings. And I want to ask the group. This is kind of fun. This is kind of like infotainment. I want to ask the group, which of these wines did you like best with this? And maybe one or two of you may want to make a comment about it. The takeaway is cheese is a near-perfect food. Once we have this cheese, we will not eat anything else. Shh. We're going to eat other things, but we're going to be sated. Cheese is near complete food. Complete, complete food. What's missing the cheese? It gives you everything that you need, nutritionally speaking, except for what? Some carbs are there. What's missing? You can't answer Babs. Babs, no, she's already attended my master series. <laughs> carrots. There are no carrots and cheese. No. <laughs> yeah, Mary Virginia, that's right. I mean, there may be a new cheese made in Wisconsin with carrots in it. But uh, there are a couple things missing in cheese, and that, uh, that is vitamin C and fiber. So you can live without vitamin C for a couple of days if you don't mind the onset of rickets. Uh, you can live without fiber, fiber for a couple of days if you don't mind going under discoveries. Otherwise, you can live off the of cheese. So it's all there. Now let's try cheese number two. Minus the goat. Hey. Some people don't like Boy. goat cheeses. So that first cheese is kind of a gateway cheese for goats. The second cheese is a mix of uh, cow and sheep. And you'll find you have different pairing potentials just by delivering with the goat. The cheese are virtually identical in every other way and produce almost next door to each other. They're eating the same kind of food. They're drinking the same kind of water. But the 10 o'clock on the top left of your plate, the one that's kind of soft and runny. Well, the first cheese is kind of soft and runny, too. Let me help you find it. On the top left of your plate, you should have the formula of uh, Dui Latte. Dui Latte meaning two milks. Soft cheese. It does have a little skin on the outside, which is perfectly edible. The rind of the cheese is a, uh, a bloomy rind. On the top left of your plate. Right, that's the one. The one that's kind of rectangular shaped. It looks like a slice of brie somewhat. This is Italy's answer to brie. The French excelled in making those those fat added cheeses like the double crowns and the triple crowns with the blue rind on the outside, especially in the 18th century. And so the Italians said, well, what are we going to do to one up the French on this? As a dessert cheese, a table cheese. They thought, well, maybe we'll mix a little bit of sheep's milk into the blend. Or maybe some sheep and goat's milk into the blend by adding extra milk with the extra nutrients, with the extra flavor profiles, the textures, and aromas from the other animals, then they had a cheese that didn't have its own extra qualities to it. The French rarely do that. Mixing milks? No, they no. That doesn't happen very much. But they always kind of cool with it. And the Americans are pretty cool with it too. By the way, right now, the, the Excitement is occurring in the cheese world is occurring right here with our shores. America has become a net exporter of cheese for the first time in almost 100 years. Almost half a billion dollars worth of dairy products were exported from the United States. So the dairy business is doing its part to offset the trade deficit. 
So which of these, and so with the uh, first cheese Romeo Rocchetto, which wine would you like best? Who liked the white wine best, the Arnais best? Quite a few of you. Who liked the Valpolicella best? Not quite as many, but it was about 50-50. So it was there, 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 it was good with both of them, right? It was not bad with either, would you say? What about the cheese number two, the Robo Messina? The same cheese minus the goat's bone. So which uh, who liked the white wine best with the Robo uh, due latte? Uh, about a third of you. Who liked the uh, the Vapolicella best? About the same. Wow, I'm interested, uh, that's interesting to see. I would have thought red white would have done a little bit better with the uh, with the Romulo Duolati. Cheese number three. This is from the Benefit. This is a type of cheese that is uh, to protect the cheese, to add care to the cheese. They would oftentimes, especially this part of Italy, they would uh, rub down the cheese with great must. This gives a flavor to cheese. It also helps to get the cheese's skin. It doesn't have the kind of skin you have the first two cheeses, but this is the type of cheese that you would say, well, it's got a red grain must on the outside, so it's probably better with the red wine. Not necessarily. Some of the dogma about very cheap wine is the cheese only works with red wine. Have you heard that? You probably also heard the opposite. Cheese only works with white wine. You've also heard that cheese and wines from the same place work best. That's the worst of them. Some of the best grains that I've found are op uh, produced op on opposite sides of the planet. It's a good starting point, though. Go ahead and try the Ubriaco. Ubriaco meaning drunk. Ubriaco de Ramos. Ramos. Try it with white wine, then try it with red. It will come back to it in a couple of minutes, but take your time. Remember, the first taste is the carry flavors forward. The second taste is more the actual taste of the carry. Use water frequently. Have a little bread. The bread works like a swab and picks up acids and fats left behind by the cheeses and wines and takes the next curry up the more accurately. If you don't finish each of the cheeses, that's okay. The hard cheeses you can sit, you can set into your pocket. You can do that with the soft cheese too if you have a good dry cleaner. But you own a waste of this cheese, it's just too good. Now let's go to two o'clock on your plate, back to the Piemonte on the northwest side of Italy, the heart of daring of Italy, and also some of the greatest wines produced in the world. This is the Valtellina Cassetta. Cassetta, interesting about the word cassetta, this is the root word of cassetta is casey is the Latin word for cheese. That's how it got its name. Cassetta. The root, root word for cheese is casey is too, by the way. Valtellina is the place. Val is in valley, valley, but it is in the upper elevations of the Piemonte nonetheless. This is a good thing with the upper elevations. And so there is, in the slow food movement, we appreciate the cheese produced in the upper elevations because of the diversity of plant species, the pristine waters that the animals enjoy, which makes high quality cheeses with a great diversity of conjugated linoleic acid, among many other nutrients, a proven cancer fighter and weight reducer, among many other qualities. Cheese will make you lose weight. You have to be careful with the cheese diet. You have to supplement it with extra wine. Uh, the wine will help metabolize the proteins in the cheese, so the amino acids, the building blocks of the wines are more easily assimilated and used by our bodies to build up the protein chains of which we are composed. The, pro the wine also gives you some of the calories because the cheese diet will end up with, you'll end up with a deficiency because cheese does give you satiety in a number of ways. You have to watch out for the cheese diet. I have a hard time keeping weight on it. I have a hard time keeping my pants up too. <laughs> for a number of reasons. So, the cheese number four and the final cheese are almost identical. 
So the last cheese is Vito. These are two DOP cheeses. These are named protected, internationally protected cheeses. Very highly esteemed. Methods of making the geographical locations where the name is very, very well protected. The next cheese is the final cheese is Vito. Same format, but the Beto is more of an alpine type of cheese. It's also a skim to milk cheese. They skim off some of the butter fats to make these cheeses. They do that with the other one too, but by skimming this off, they save the butter to have the butter for the fat. The Beto has just a little bit of goat's milk mixed into it. The Beto is also only made in the warmer months of the year when the cows and the goats are looking for elevations and join the diversity of plant species they have. Wait for the finish with this cheese, it's fairly powerful. This is a fairly demanding cheese, but it's extremely nutritious. Very good for you. And then note your pairings. White wine or red wine? Okay, I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So look at your scores between your white wine and your red wine. Uh, how many of us prefer red wines only? Yeah, it's a big group. How many, how many of us prefer white wines mostly or only? Yeah, red wines are very popular. Okay, so try to set aside your, your preferences for wine types. Of the two wine types, which wine performed better across all five cheeses? The white or the red? All right, we need to see a show of hands in. So if you have your scores, top to bottom, your plus ones, your plus twos, subtracting the minuses, and on down, uh, look at your comparisons. Which of you have had higher scores for your white wines overall? Raise your hand, please. The white wine scores were higher than the red wines. I just want to see a show of hands. Okay, for the red wines. Okay, it looks like it was about 50-50. This suggests that there is an element of subjectivity involved. Yes? But there are some principles periods that come into play. The, the hungry, thirst, the salt, the sweet, acids come into play, the size of cheese, the size of the wine. And these, are, of course, are not identical uh, uh, in size wines. And these are big flavored cheeses. At least uh, three, four, and five are very big flavored cheeses. And so maybe the Arnaise was a little more successful with the first two wines, right? Were any of these pairings stand out pairings that said you were said that said to you it's like wow I want to do that again? Which one? With the Arnaise with the white wine. Which one? The first wine and the first cheese? The red one with the person. It's red. It's crazy. This is what I find when we go through cheese and wine pairings in a group this size. Usually the first combination you have is your favorite combination. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is your palate is more neutral. It's not confused by other flavors. There's no hunger and thirst, anticipation, all that. But when you have other flavors added on top, then it becomes a little more complex and not as easy to understand.